Three nights in February 1941 changed the course of Swansea forever, and those three nights became a scar that many families in Swansea will never forget. This is the story of the Swansea Blitz. This is, is a hugely Im important wall, isn't it? And, and probably one of the most important pictures here is, is the starting point, which is a German picture, isn't it? It is, yes. Uh, the Germans were quite methodical, quite thorough, and they took photos of all the English and Welsh towns and cities, and then went back to Germany and had a coffee and decided where they were going to bomb, which were the economic targets, which were the centres that they needed to get rid of, and that's what this one shows. It's uh, 15th of February 1941. They were marking the target areas on the map of the photo of Swansea. So they were targeting the docks, targeting the railway lines, some of the smaller factories and the railway station. Mm. And then they came over on the 19th of Feb and the 20th and the 21st and obliterated the old medieval town centre. Because it was, it was gutted, wasn't it? it was the heart of the city was, was ripped out. High explosive bombs blowing things up, blowing up quite substantial buildings like the old Ben Evans, three-storey department store, and then the incendiary starting the fire, so all the wood and all the rubble would have just burnt away, and you're left with just big piles of rubble. The city would have been so different had the Blitz not happened. Oh, quite different, yes. Going back to its early Viking roots and then the Norman town uh, in the area where the castle is now, Castle Bailey, and then Victorian streets, very narrow little winding streets, Goat Street, Temple Street, Victorian, very much Dickensian. As you see round by uh, the No Sign Bar and the little salubrious passage, very much like that. That would have been the character of the town. So we know a part, at least, of the, of the castle was destroyed. Yes. The tower stayed, though, didn't it, for a while after? Yes, uh, the Evening Post had a building there and that helped um, keep the fabric together. But uh, a lot of it was just that survived miraculously, perhaps. Castle building with its big white arches survived, but Ben Evans was gone totally. And the decision was made not to rebuild anything on that spot and to keep it as the Memorial Gardens. And certainly I remember the Memorial Gardens in the 60s as quite a beautiful, pleasant spot. Mm. And then it's become now Castle Square. Still a centre for the city, still brings people in. And perhaps we need to remind people more of why that's there. It is a memorial to everything that happened in the city. Something that I always find fascinating is that on, on old pictures like this, old Swansea, that the river was very close to the castle. Yes, the river had a slightly different course. The original navigation came right next to where the castle is now and where New Cut was subsequently built. So that was the Viking settlement because the long boats would row up the river there. And then the Normans built their castle right next to the river. And then, of course, all the rubble and the debris from the Blitz after the war was pushed into that part of the river, filling it all in, and ultimately they built Plantasia and Toys R Us and the Tenpin Bowling on that site. So the course of the river was, was changed just after the war? The river was there as well. The, the river had two branches to it almost, and this was a, a loop, but they did fill it in after the war. 3-0 bombers. Looks like they're heading for Swansea. Do you know, for someone who has always had a fascination about the Three Night Splits, this place can bring to life the smells, the sounds and the visuals, probably like nothing else possibly could. It has the ability to pull you out of the present day and take you back to those tragic three nights that changed the face of Swansea forever. And how the streets of Swansea would have looked with its reconstruction, consisting of a pub and a lounge bar plus the shop fronts of the 1940s, this place feels very real. I was always fascinated by the stories from my parents and wanted to look into it in a bit more detail, but then of course passing it on to other people because I realised that a lot of the stories were not being told, a lot of these anecdotes that people have got in, in their families were not being recorded. So hopefully we can now do that here in 1940 Swansea. 
And there's, there's some items, we were sp speaking earlier, that there's, there's still gardens that have air raid shelters in the, in the back garden. There are. We do get phone calls. Uh, I went up to Morriston only a few years ago and helped take down a shelter that we could reuse. But boy, what a job it was. We had to dig out all the earth and then get the concrete out from the floor. And it took three of us two long, hard days. So we've been offered another one since from Port Albert. And even we're a bit wary about taking that task on again. We saw a gap in people's knowledge where so many people in town knew about what had happened to Swansea and the story of Swansea, but it wasn't being passed on to people. And we saw this gap, my brother and I, and we thought, well, let's set something up where we can pass this knowledge on and tell people the amazing story of what happened to Swansea and how it got to where it is now and perhaps where it's going to go in the future. And it was dis destroyed for, for years, wasn't it? Yes, it took a long time. Britain at the time, right through the late 40s and early 50s, was going through quite a heavy recession then. And rationing was still on until 1952, 53 for some items. So the economic recovery was slow and the rebuilding was slow. So yes, there was rubble and debris for quite a while. We try and paint the picture with some of the 9, 10 and 11 year olds that visit. There were fire teams from all over, from as far away as Bristol and Bath, they were pulled in. The resources that were needed to deal with the Three Nights Blitz were incredible. And this was a time before motorways with just railway lines, pulling resources in from everywhere and everybody just trying to do the best and to get on with it and get on with their normal lives. Here is the Midnight News and this is Alvar Liddell reading it. Up to 10 o'clock... 175 German aircraft. As time goes on, as we, we get further away from that three night blitz, I suppose it's getting more scarce to find things from that period, isn't it? Yes and no. We still get panicky phone calls on a Tuesday afternoon or a Friday morning. We're doing a house clearance. The skip is here. We've got some stuff. And if you don't come and collect it now, the skip is going in half an hour. And you race across the other side of town and you get there and it's some plastic bits and bobs from the 1960s. Or occasionally it is something that's really rare and you think, crikey, I'm so glad I made the effort. But it's hard then to explain that to other people, that these things are worth considering and are worth looking after. So how did you start with this, this dream, in effect? It's something we'd always wanted to do, my brother and I. We'd always had a background in it. He had worked for uh, National Trust and for CADU and the National Museum of Wales. I'd been an archaeologist and done a master's in heritage management. But the turning point was I'd been out in Iraq with the army in 2003. When I came home on leave, I didn't want to go back to my civil service job. And I said, hey, we're either going to do it now or we'll never do it. And we'll just be talking about it over a glass of red wine or a lager. So let's just do it. And there we are. We did it. I want to remind you about how very important it is that all water shall be boiled before being What's used What's your most memorable part of this, of this museum? I think it's funny because the totality of it, looking at the, the breadth of experience, talking about rationing, I don't know how people managed to survive on some of the rations, but of course dig for victory, growing your own veg was such a big part of people's lives. And in many ways, the fact that we're now going full circle and people are growing their own fruit and veg again now because it's organic, there are less pesticides. But the big talk now is food miles are reduced. So we're not moving food from Kenya to Britain. You can grow your own runner beans quite simply. But of course, they were doing that during the war. So it's fascinating to see how things like make, do and mend, reusing things and recycling, such an important part of the war. And it's taken us nearly 80 years to remember all of these things that they were doing then. A place like this is so important, isn't it? It is because some of the stories that people come in and tell us, which we try to record, are being lost. We're just at the very end of the generation that lived through the war firsthand. Both my parents have sadly passed on, so they were the last of that generation that lived there and did it. And all I've got are their stories and their recollections. So hopefully, if we can pass this on to other people, that will be our legacy. <laughs> We, we love our city, obviously, and the history of this place, this city, is so rich. It is. We've got a lot to look at, a lot to take forward, and the council are now going ahead with a bid to be City of Culture in 2021. And if we can play a small part in that, we've got so much that we can offer, not just to South Wales, but to the world. And hopefully we will do that in, over the next few years. And talking of the future as well, you're actually going to be an information point as well, aren't you? 
The big scheme at the moment is to have local visitor information points across the area to give information to local people and to visitors and to guests from all over the world about exactly what's here, what's on offer all year round. And if someone wants to find out more information about what you do here, how do they do that? Through Facebook or through the internet, a simple search for 1940 Swansea will find us and through us that will take you through our visitor information point onto the council and all the wealth of information that's out there. <laughs>